Okay, well, welcome uh, to my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. Today's uh, lecture is mutual funds, target rich environment, lots of uh, performance opportunities in play. Uh, had a friend of mine, Clarice, she's worked very, very hard to accumulate for what in her world is a lot of money, $4,000. And she said, Dean, what do you think I should do with my $4,000? I said, Clarice, do you have the time, temperament, and expertise to be managing money, doing battle with the uh, Mr. Market every day? She goes, no. I said, well, then you ought to hire yourself a professional. She says, man, I can hire a professional with as little as $4,000. I said, Clarice, there's men and women who have sold their soul to manage that $4,000 for you. You know, a mutual fund is the easiest way for uh, retail investors to access professional management. Now I joke, if you pass your series seven, if you're listening to this and you're taking a series seven, you know, if you're, you know, this, you could be listening to this, it's appropriate for six, 65, uh, SIE, you know, all of them. I mean, mutual funds are a big part of what we do. My joke is though, if you are teaching, uh, taking your series seven, you pass and you go to your manager and say, I know I have a series seven. I know I have full registration, but is it okay if I just sell mutual funds? Most managers would say, wow, that would be wonderful. <laughs> you know? If you want us to terrify your manager, come back and say, oh, man, I just love this, uh, you know, multiple option strategies and discretion and margin, Ooh, you know, <laughs> oh, well. Uh, I have here the uh, title slide, and I thought we'd spend a couple minutes here on this title slide before we actually uh, get going here. What are some of the advantages of a mutual fund? As we said, the number one reason to buy a mutual fund is access professional management. Now, some of you are gonna be taking a 63 or a 65 or a 66. And the professional management to a mutual fund is provided by a federally covered registered investment advisor. For example, Fidelity Management Research is the professional manager, the investment advisory firm to the Fidelity funds. So you get professional management. Uh, mutual funds typically have lower costs. Now there are some expenses to a mutual fund. So let's just get this up here. You know, expenses to a mutual fund. You're going to have to pay for a uh, board members. We're going to have a board of directors and they need to be compensated. We're going to need a, a custodian to hold the monies and securities. Yep, still here. Good work if you can get it. We said we're gonna have a, an investment advisor, that's a firm, by the way, not an individual, the portfolio manager works for the investment advisor. And uh, we're gonna be talking about, if you uh, think, wow, this mutual fund thing is a cool thing, you know, maybe I should start my own mutual fund. I don't know why you'd wanna start your own mutual fund. There are more mutual funds than there are Taco Bells. There are actually more mutual funds than there are securities put into them. But if you wanna start your own mutual fund, you'd have to comply with the Investment Company Act of 1940 and one of the rules of uh, 1940 is that you have to have a board, some board members who represent the public. And so what this says is that at least 40% of the people on your board had to be disinterested. Now, if it comes, for example, time to implement a, a 12B1 fee, a promotional expense, we'll talk about that later. We're gonna need a majority vote of the outside board members, people who aren't affiliated with the fund. You know, Franklin Templeton, the, you know, founding family or the Johnson family. And so, you know, these are people that don't work for the fund, don't represent the Johnsons, you know, probably the guy who went to college with them, I'm joking, but you know, well. Uh, the other thing the Investment Company Act of 1940 says, besides that, if you want to start your own mutual fund, the 60-40 interlocking director rule is that you need to have 100,000. I think that is ridiculously low, personally, by the way, to start your own mutual fund. You know, 100 grand in 1940, I guess was, you know, to start your own mutual fund, you need 100 shareholders. And you need a clearly defined investment objective. Now, uh, as I said, even after paying all those fees, that's still lower cost perhaps than other things. As you see here, I have as compared to, as compared to, oh, for example, as compared to a hedge fund, 
You know, a hedge fund is typically going to charge you two and 22% of the assets under management and 20% of the profits. It's going to only be available to accredited investors. Stevie Cohen, who's a hedge fund guy, uh, bought the New York Mets. He's, he gets three and 30. So, oh my goodness. So mutual funds are lower cost than perhaps other ways of conducting business. I remember one time I was trying to sell a guy a tax refund and a mutual fund, a tax refund. And he said, he said, Dean, my broker tells me I'm too sophisticated for a mutual fund. And I said, well, you may be that guy. I've never met such a person, but maybe it's you. <laughs> um, I called the kid. He said, but I still like to talk to you. So I came out. He said, Dean, I'm just looking this over. And I, do I pay to buy and sell bonds? I said, yeah, if you buy a bond, you're going to pay the mark up. And if you sell a bond, you're going to pay the mark down. He said, you know, I'm thinking here that this mutual fund probably gets a better deal buying and selling bonds than I'm ever going to get. I said, you're absolutely correct. I mean, you know, if the fund manager, the investment advisor firm wants to buy bonds, they are certainly going to get a better deal than you. Anyways, he kind of had sold himself on the mutual fund. Now, of all those expenses, of all those expenses to the fund, RTFQ, that means read the full question. Of all those expenses to the fund, the investment advisor is the largest single expense. I would know that as a potential test uh, operating. Now, remember in our lectures, I think I've made this clear a couple of times. When I put TQ or say it's a test question, that doesn't mean verbatim it's a test question. It means you can expect testable content around that. Now, sometimes, you know, we might be pretty spot on. I know about you when I take a test, I like to get to the first question. I know I know the answer to. I go, ooh, you know, there's one I know. Now be careful again because RTFQ. I didn't ask what's the single largest expense to the fund shareholder. That might be the load, and that's a different might be a different answer. So, are you asking me asked about the fund? Are you being asked about the person who's going to invest in the fund? The load, the four percent or eight eight and a half percent, we'll find out later is the max. That's not paid by the fund. That's paid by the uh, customer. The investment advisor I would know is the single largest expense to the fund. All right, so we get professional management, we get low cost, uh, we get some diversification. So a couple test questions here. On all exams, you get tested on what's called selection risk, also known as non-systematic risk or non-systemic, depending on how you wanna pronounce it. You know, there were 10 equally suitable ideas. I picked one of the 10. The other nine did fine. The one I picked went bankrupt. So the easiest way to do that is not to pick just one. You know, in the introduction to the tease to this uh, lecture, I said Bernard Baruch, a legendary Wall Street speculator, said money is like manure and you ought to spread it around. And so the first test question is how do you avoid selection or systematic risk? And test question, the way you do that in fact, let me get a bigger font here. That is worth a bigger font. Let's go for, for that too. Let's go for a different color. Let's see what colors we have available here. Let's go with, let's go with this one. And so the easiest way to avoid selection risk is diversification. Looks like I picked too big a font. Let me change the font here. Got a little carried away. There we go, that looks like it might work. Diversification. Now, you know, somebody asked me, uh, you know, if you're, uh, again, I don't know where you're watching this, whether you're watching this on the YouTube channel or you're watching it or you accessed it through subreddit or for from LinkedIn, wherever you may be accessing it from. But anyways, one of the guys on the uh, subreddit, R Series 7, that's a little community we have where, you know, people who are candidates and matriculating through their SIE to their 6, 7, and then 63, 65, 66. You know, we provide, uh, you know, community to support them emotionally and intellectually. Anyways, he was asking me about uh, the tax-free lecture, Dean. Did you sell tax-free bonds or did you sell, you know, tax-free uh, blocks of bonds or did you sell tax-free mutual funds? And I said, well, it just depends. I mean, if the guy has a large enough portfolio or can create a large enough portfolio, I would be buying him blocks of muni bonds. But, you know, a lot of people uh, don't have access to build their own diversified portfolio. And so the easiest way for most people, follow on test question, by the way, the follow on test questions, so let's review, there's two, and this is on all exam, you should know this. There's what's called selection risk or non-systematic risk. That's a test question. The easiest way to avoid it is to diversify 
That's a test question. And the easiest way for most people to diversify is in the context of a mutual fund. Let me just put a little, let's see, I might be getting too clever for my own good. Let's see if that works. Hey, I got a little white exclamation point there. Uh, just so you know, I'm purposely trying not to follow the flow of Kaplan or STC or Past Perfect or their books or their slides for a couple of reasons. I want you to have this as a supplement, a different discussion. And so, you know, uh, I'm getting better at uh, creating PowerPoints things. It's not my, you know, my expertise. So what I usually do is, you know, decide how I'm going to go about talking about things. And then if I can find somebody else's slide that isn't copyrighted and I have a for use uh, to use it for use, I, I do it. So I didn't pick this slide, but I found it and I kind of like it and gives me an excuse to kind of talk about what I want to talk about. So that's why I didn't have the exclamation point. But anyways, there in the diversification, that's the second reason you buy a mutual fund. So, you know, my friend Clarice, she could with her $4,000, put it all on the GameStop. I hope not. I'm joking, but right. Or she could buy a hundred shares of a $40 stock, but then she wouldn't be properly diversified. Here she's buying proportionate ownership in a diversified portfolio that's being professionally managed. And so the easiest way for most people to access uh, diversification is through a mutual fund. That too is testable. Now, she still has systematic risk, the tendency of securities prices to move together. So the way we sometimes say that is risk prevails despite diversification. So, you know, I don't care what, uh, you know, funds you have as the market goes down 3000 points today and you have an equity fund, it probably went down too. If it didn't, you'd say, oh my goodness, that's, that's amazing. So there is a, a tendency of securities prices to move together, risks in the system and diversification there is still gonna prevail that the risk will still prevail despite your diversification. Now, what we might want to try to do, not this uh, lecture, we might want to get you something that has negative correlation with your financial assets like your mutual fund, you know, maybe some precious metals, something like that. A low minimum investment, that's pretty cool. I mean, you know, a lot of money managers have many uh, minimum relationships, registered investment advisors of like a million dollars. I kind of joke, they don't have anything, you know, against poor people, they just don't like talking to them. I mean, my, if my friend Clarice calls a registered investment advisor and she says she has $4,000 to invest, you know, click. But a mutual fund, you can get in as little as $500. I wouldn't be surprised to find out. I started out retail many, many years ago and I did a lot of uh, my business in mutual funds. In those days, it was $500. I wouldn't be surprised to find out you can get in as little as, you know, with a learned intent, maybe 50 bucks or maybe just agreed to put something in. So. Uh, the point here is it's a much lower threshold. It's more easier, again, major point, for retail investors to be able to access professional manage management through a mutual fund because, again, this very low minimum investment. You know, I joke, uh, one of these hedge fund guys opened up his hedge fund. We lose a lot of our portfolio managers. He was a mutual fund manager. Didn't like all the restrictions that we're discussing. He said, I'm out of here. You know, he left and he set up a hedge fund. It was a minimum of $50 million with a five-year lockup, which means all those retail investors no longer have access to him. You know, he was the tenured portfolio manager at the fund. So, you know, now you say, man, now there's a new guy. Maybe the new guy's good too. Who, who knows? But oh, well. So a low minimum investment. I call this the uh, flexible issues, just ease of ownership. It's just a lot easier to own a mutual fund than it is to own the individual securities. You know, for example, if I own like 20... Uh, individual stocks in my portfolio, 20 stocks, I'm going to get three quarterly reports on 20 stocks. I'm going to get 60 quarterly reports that I'm going to get all pretty, pretty much at the same time. I'm going to get 10 annual reports, 10, 10 Ks, you know, all at about the same time. Ugh. You know, another mutual one, just easier. I'm going to get two, a semi-annual statement of what's going on with the discussion. Semi-annual, pay attention. You know, some funds do it quarterly, but the minimum under the Investment Company Act is semi-annual. And, you know, you can get a fractional interest in it, you know. Oh, I still got it on white. <laughs> Let me put it on black. <laughs> Semi-annual reports. Be careful. You know, I told you a lot of funds do this quarterly, but the minimum standard in the investment company act in 1940. Other things, fractional interest, I told you. Uh, you know, when you go to withdraw, you can do a percentage withdrawal or you can do, you know, X number of shares. And at the end of the day, it's just easier. All right, so uh, let's get started. Let's get started. Let me clearing up my slime. You know, I joke here on this professional management. <laughs> we said it is low cost, but you know, there is a problem with having monkeys harvest bananas. 
Are we clear what the problem is with monkeys harvesting bananas? They eat the product, right? The product here is money. However, these monkeys eat less of the product than some of their other, you know, monkey friends like hedge fund guys. So, you know, again, it's still lower cost than other things. All right, well, I told you, here's the three reasons to buy a mutual fund. As we said, professional management, we said the professional management is provided by a registered investment advisory firm. You know, I gave you the example of Fidelity, the investment advisor to the Fidelity Fund is Fidelity Management Research. So you're getting professional management. You get diversification. Now the minimum diversification requirement, if you're gonna to refer to your fund as being diversified is 75, five and 10. So let me just put an example on here. Let's say I'm managing a $100 million fund. Let me put that in a different color. Uh, managing a $100 million fund. Uh, I have to have this $100 million invested in such a fashion that no more than 75 million is invested in such a fashion Seven hundred fifty million invested in such a way that no more than five percent of the seventy-five million is in any one position. You know what that will do is guarantee some minimum level of diversification. Now, if I don't mean that, no more than five percent. Let's get that fixed. If I don't do that, I can't refer to myself as a diversified fund. Now, from previous lectures, you should know that if a mutual fund or anyone for that matter owns 10% of more of the target company stock, they become a principal stockholder. And we can't have an open-end mutual fund becoming a, uh, an insider because they got to meet redemption requests. So a mutual fund is not allowed to be a principal stockholder. So that's what that 10% is. That 10% is ownership in the target company. You know, because a lot of mutual funds have enough money to buy the entire company lock, stock, and barrel, and they're supposed to be passive. So they're 10% ownership in a target company. I mean, stock, by the way. And if they don't meet that, they can't refer to themselves as diversified. Now, this isn't designed to guarantee mediocrity. This isn't designed to guarantee mediocrity. So please note in this example, I still have 25 million. If I have a strong uh, conviction, I'm strongly convicted about that 25 million, I could load up. I could have two 12 and a half million or 125 million, whatever I want to do there, as long as again, I'm not a principal stockholder. And then we said the last reason you buy a mutual fund is professional ownership, as uh, ease of ownership. Just easier running mutual funds. I mean, you know, when I came to the business, there was a top producer named Norm and Norm was like, you remember me reminded me of Jesus and the Lowe's, you know, yeah, I believed in prospecting large pools of money, not large pools of people. And Norm, who's a bigger producer than me, is the exact opposite. You know, because I would qualify you and I'd say, hey, you know, if this is an investment idea you like, you know, is 50000 a problem at this particular time? And, you know, I want to make sure you got some money before we start, you know, spending a lot of time on you. But anyways, Norm would say, Dean, getting 50000 once is the same as getting 5000 10 times. And that's what he would do. Now, there's no way Norm could conduct that business if he wasn't using mutual funds, because it would just be too operationally difficult for him to be managing the individual securities and calling people. So, you know, all he was doing is basically mutual funds. Easier for him, by the way, you know, he can fire the manager because it ain't him, right? So. All right, so the, here, this slide is worth three, four, perhaps five uh, test questions. One of the things you got to do on your exam is distinguish between open-end mutual funds and closed-end mutual funds. So open-end funds, open-end, are continually offering new shares to the public. Remember, in a primary transaction, you know, this is testable at all kinds of different levels, but, for, you know, right now what we're saying, in the primary market, as you recall, the issuer, in this case, the open-end mutual fund, receives the proceeds. And so that's what we, well, let me change. It looks like it's too late to change the color. I don't really like that. Let me get out my, my, um, Uh, 
looks like I'm having troubles with my, there we go. Uh, Let me start over there. Let me start over. So we said, very testable on a lot of different levels to know that when the issuer receives the proceeds, that is a primary transaction. And let me put that in a different color. And then I uh, want you to make sure you've got that. Let's uh, just put a little thing across that. And secondary market, remember the previous owner receives the pre proceeds. So let's put that over here. Previous owner receives proceeds. So this slide is worth uh, quite a bit of uh, test questions. You know, I had a young lady who missed the, the day we were going over this and good news, she passed her test, but when she was talking about her exam and I was talking to her about it, she goes, Dean, you know, we didn't talk about open end and closed end funds. And I had three, four questions on that. And I said, well, as you recall, you left early and you know, what can I do? Good news, you passed, right? So that means not only does an open end mutual fund have to comply with the Investment Company Act of 1940, they further have to comply with the Prospectus Act. Do you recall what the Prospectus Act is? The Prospectus Act, remember, is 33. So they got to comply with both of those. Now, after we do the IPO, then the, the closed end fund is going to trade in the secondary market. So be careful, Series Sixes. With a Series Six, you're allowed to sell brand new uh, mutual funds with a prospectus. And so, kind of a trick: Can a Series Six person sell a closed end fund? The answer is yes, if it's the IPO and they're using a prospectus. But once it's trading the secondary market, no Sixes can't do that. That would be something you need a Seven to be getting people involved in. Now, in an open-end fund, you're doing business directly with the mutual fund itself. And so the mutual fund is going to cash you out. They're going to redeem you. So you put in your redemption request, and they're going to redeem you at the next computation of the NAV. The next computation of the NAV. That is very testable. Let's get that going up here. Let me get a bigger font. This idea that you're always doing business with an open-end mutual fund based on the next computation of the NAV, oh, that's not going to do. We're going to have to have much bigger. That's called forward pricing. That is very testable. I don't know of any draw. You know, I'm, as I joke, I don't know what kind of draw you're going to get on your test. I don't know what kind of draw you're going to get. I'm dreaming for you a dream draw. Everything you studied shows up. You say, I don't know what the big deal is. And that's a dream draw. And every once in a while you get the face of death draw. You're like, oh my God, you're, you're struggling. And when I say something's a guaranteed test question, that just means I know of no draw in which you're not going to be asked the question. This idea that in an open-end uh, fund, we're always doing business, whether you're coming in or getting out, it's based on that next computation. Now, the Investment Company Act of 1940 says that you have to calculate, a mutual fund has to calculate its NAV at least once per business day. I would know that as well. I would know that as well. So I got to do that Whoop. at least once per business day. Now in a closed end fund, that's not true. In a closed end fund, in a closed end fund, the shares are not redeemable. They trade in a secondary market. That's very much a test issue, right? Uh, I'm not a very good prospect for a domestic mutual fund. And the reason I'm not a very good prospect for a domestic mutual fund is because, call it hubris on my part, but if you uh, use that opening that I used with Clarice, you say, Dean, do you have the time, temperament, and expertise to be managing money? I say, yes, I've been doing it for 30 years, and I'm a retired professional. So yes, I, I end of story, right? Because then there's no sense in me if I feel like I have the expertise to be you know, in some mutual fund. Now, I would be the first to admit that perhaps in certain areas, where I should have assets allocated, I don't have the time, temperament, expertise. One of those would be Mexico. And you know, Mexico has a Mexico fund, MXF. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange. It trades just like a stock. And so, you know, the Mexico fund manager doesn't have to worry about meeting redemption requests. 
If you can't handle the volatility of the Mexican Mexican market, which is pretty volatile, you don't call and say, I'd like to redeem. You just sell your shares simply to someone else for more than or less than you originally pay. So an open-end fund can only issue common stock only, common stock only. Now, what we mean by that is one class of equity is sometimes how we say that is a test issue. Yeah, you may, we may have different share classes in terms of, uh, you know, loads, but, you know, there's only the money we have to manage only comes from selling those fund, those shares we were talking about. You know, my uh, Mexico fund, my Mexico fund, if it chose to, could issue preferred stock. Issue, you know, for example, 5% uh, preferred stock in the Mexico fund. Take the proceeds and make additional investments within Mexico. If my Mexico fund wanted to, closed in fund, it could issue Mexico fund debentures. Promise the Mexico fund debenture holders 7%, take the proceeds and make additional investments within Mexico. So again, there's more flexibility to a closed in fund. More flexibility, by the way, more freedom to the manager means more risk, right? You know, he gets more freedom, doesn't have to meet redemption requests, and he can do things that uh, open end fund managers cannot. We said the biggest testable distinction is this idea about open end, there is no secondary trading, whereas in a uh, closed end fund, there is secondary trading, either in the auction order driven market of the New York Stock Exchange, like the Mexico fund where they're just matching buyers and sellers, or some closed end funds may trade in the uh, over-the-counter market, where there's market makers who are willing to buy the bid and sell at the ask. Price by a formula, the NAV, which we said, calculated once per business day, plus the sales charge equals the public offering price. We're gonna be doing this at nauseum here in a little bit. And then test question, the maximum load in an open-end fund, the maximum load is eight and a half percent. That is very much something you should know on your exam. I don't know of any funds anymore that charge eight and a half percent. Oop, looks like I, let me get rid of that. A chance to redeem myself here. The technical name for a mutual fund that uh, charges eight and a half percent is called a full service fund. And boy, if you're charging somebody eight and a half percent, you better show them a lot of love. Yeah, most of this stuff varies from fund to fund as stipulated in the prospectus. Uh, you, listen, I would amend my RTFQ, as you recall, RTFQ means read the full question. And I would amend that to say RTFA, read the full answer set. You know, sometimes I just like to shop the answer set and see what answers are available to me before I start answering. And if one of my answers is as stipulated in the prospectus, Man, I don't know what the question is, but that's a heck of an answer. I think that's the answer before I even read the question. Now, another testable distinction is this idea of the X date. You know, the X is Latin for without. As I always joke, if you have an X spouse, that means you're no longer trading with your spouse attached. And so X date is, remember, the first date on which a mutual fund or a stock trades without the dividend. And we would expect the mutual fund, open a mutual fund, or the stock to go down by the amount of the dividend. Now, in a mutual fund, open a mutual fund, all of the, uh, you're doing business directly with the fund. There is no secondary trading. And so the X date, all the dates are set by the board of directors. And the X date is one business day after the record. Whereas remember in the X date, it's set by the Uniform Practice Code in secondary trading. The Uniform Practice Code standardizes secondary trading within the securities industry. And so that X date in secondary markets, one business day prior to record, is set by the Uniform Practice Code of either New York Stock Exchange or uh, FINRA, depending on where the security is trading, but it's not set by the Board of Directors, and it's one business day after the record. So make sure you can distinguish uh, between these two. In fact, I made a little slide here so we could kind of look at this and make sure you understand what the testable distinction is. So open end versus a closed end. So RTFQ, is it DREP or is it DERP? You know, those are mnemonics memory aids. Is it DREP or is it DERP? Now, more often than not on your exam, it's going to be DERP. There's more questions about the DERP scenario than there are about the DREP scenario, right? So we said the board of directors gets together and declares the dividend. 
They say we're going to pay it to shareholder as of record. We're going to look at our shareholder list. And if you're on the shareholder list on that date, you get the dividend. Now, as we said, in stocks, it takes two business days to get on the shareholder list. So the point is, if you buy, you know, one day before the record, you're not going to be there in time. Now, this lecture isn't about DERP and DREP. It's about mutual funds. But I just want to make sure you understand the testable distinction. And so here, you know, on the test, you need to know that is not set by the board of directors. That, that is a function. That is a function of the Uniform Practice Code, where in this version, in this version, all these dates, all these dates are set uh, by the board of directors. So now there's a couple of things we talked about there. We've talked about the Uniform Practice Code, but another thing you're held accountable for, we said the Uniform Practice Code standardizes practices within the securities industry. But another thing you're held accountable for is what's called the code of conduct. And the code of conduct is the ethical behavior that associated persons and broker dealers owe customers. You know, so it's not good if you come to your manager after you pass say, oh, I want to do some churning and some breakpoint sales and sales some dividends. You know, selling dividends is on all exams because the state administrators are frowning this. It's an artifice. Don't you love that word, artifice? You know, using the impending X date to close somebody is an artificial sense of urgency that doesn't actually exist. So I say, hey, listen, you buy it today, man, you get the dividend. You say, well, Dean, is it going to go down by the amount of the dividend? Would I be better served to not create the unnecessary tax situation? I say, well, gee, you're no fun. <laughs> can I talk to your, you say, Dean, can I talk to your manager? So that selling dividends is a big no-no, so. It's a violation of the code of conduct. I would definitely know that because, you know, they love to torment you on recognizing things you're not supposed to do. You know, on the test, you got to believe, believe in a human depravity and original sin. You know, human depravity and original sin. Let me clean up the slide here. All right, so I want to give you kind of an example of how this works. You know, the, the typical share class they use on the exam is the A share, which is a front end load. And as I mentioned, be careful what you're being asked. The sales charge is not paid by the fund. The sales charge is paid by the uh, investor. So remember, we said you should be reading carefully. You know, all these tests, it's a giant reading test. And boy, you got to read carefully. We said the largest single expense to the mutual fund is the investment advisor. Different question, largest single expense typically to the client is the load. So I don't know if any fund is still charging eight and a half percent, but let's assume this fund charges the maximum legal limit of eight and a half percent. And so if you invest 10,000, the fund distributor, the fund sponsor, the fund underwriter is going to cash that check. That check isn't going into the fund. And they're going to take out the load, which in this case is 850 bucks. And then there means there's going to be 9,150 it's actually going to the fund. Remember, going into the fund at the next calculation of NAV. This whole idea again of forward pricing, very testable. So the NAV plus the sales charge, the NAV here, the NAV is $9.15. The load is 85 cents. And so the public offering price is $10. Now, uh, I wanted to be able to go over that with you uh, a little more than you see it here. What I mean by that is, let me show you what I want you to be able to do. Now, I haven't on debrief had anybody tell me they've had to calculate, uh, you know, pop and NAV and do all that kind of stuff. But in the old days, that used to be pretty standard fare that you'd have to actually calculate percentage sales charge. Let me clean up this slide here. You know, and if I was going to ask you to do that, it looks like my, I'm having troubles with my annotation tool. So I don't know why it's not working. Anyways, um, I'm going to have to figure out. Uh, you know, they used to make you kind of kind of do stuff with this. And so 
you know, they used to in the old days, maybe I have to kind of take this 85 cents and divide by the public offering price and come up with eight and a half percent. You know, I have some practice problems where, you know, I'm still asking you to do that, but it's really not, not an issue like it used to be. But I did want to show you what this looks like in terms of practical application. So there's our NEV plus the sales charge, $10. That's always quoted as a percentage. And so there's that eight and a half percent. So if I ask you to calculate percentage sales charge, that's how you would go about it. Now, even though I told you I haven't had anybody tell me they've had to actually manipulate the NAV and pop in a long time, that used to be pretty standard fare where, you know, I'd say, okay, now they're going to pay a 6% load instead of eight and a half. What's the new public offering price, that kind of thing. You know, I do have some practice problems for you uh, in the practice exams if you want to look at that. But anyways, um, uh. I forgot what I was going to say. Jerry's Auto is quite as a percentage of par, eight and a half percent. They don't do that as much, but I did want to show you how this looks uh, in terms of that. So one thing you do get tested on is uh, very testable is breakpoints and letters of intent. And so we want to make sure we definitely got breakpoints and letter of intent as it relates to mutual funds. You know, mutual funds is one of the largest testable categories in all the exams because, you know, most people get where they're going financially without crashing and burning in a mutual fund. I didn't say mutual funds don't have risk. I just said of all the investment vehicles we have, they love the investment vehicle analogy, making sure we don't put the wrong driver in the wrong vehicle, right? The investment vehicle analogy. And of all the investment vehicles we have, the mutual fund is the investment vehicle. The more people arrive at their financial destination without crashing and burning than any other things we have, like, you know, multiple option strategies or oil and gas wildcat programs or, you know, other things. So here's an example that I want to show you where an investor, I'll use the uh, Franklin funds because the Franklin funds is what I used to do a lot of business in. And so let's just uh, give you an example of what this would look like. And so, for example, let's say this is the uh, Franklin uh, tax refund. And, you know, the uh, underwriters, sponsors, distributor for the Franklin Tax-Free Fund is uh, Franklin Templeton Fund Distributors. That is a FINRA member firm. That is a FINRA member firm. We'll put that here. And, you know, Franklin Fund Distributors have people that work for them who have taken and passed these exams. So there's Franklin Fund Distributors and various mutual, various broker dealers have signed selling agreements with the Franklin Funds. The Franklin Funds is not a proprietary fund. You can get the Franklin Funds or the American Funds from any broker dealer that has agreed to be a member of the selling group uh, for that fund. Let's just call this fund, I'll call this, uh, I'll use my firm, which was Gamma Global. And so Gamma has a uh, selling agreement with the Franklin Funds. And so I get an investor who says, Dean, this sounds like a wonderful idea. I want to invest $100,000 in the Franklin California Tax-Free Fund. You know, uh, Franklin had a break point at 100,000. So $99,999, you pay 4%, 100 grand or more, you pay 3%. So now this check, this check is not going into the fund. You know, the check is going to go to Franklin and Franklin's gonna cash it as we mentioned and if the load is 3%, take that out of there. And then 97 grand is going into the fund. And the client says, well, Dean, how many shares am I going to get? I said, well, I don't know until we do the next calculation of the NAV. I don't know how much that 97 grand is going to be you, be, be, uh, get you. Because remember, we're always doing business based on the next calculation. Now, Franklin typically keeps a small portion of this. They typically maybe take $200. And then $2,800 comes back to your broker dealer. And then typically I, as the broker, get a percentage of that. You know, my payout is called my payout. If my payout's, you know, 50%, that means I get $1,400 of that $2,800. That's a pretty typical uh, scenario about how mutual funds get sold. By the way, when you are, if you're a baby broker, my firm, I would tell you, why don't you look at our approved product list and uh, look at all of the uh, funds that you can get people involved in, call the person who works for the fund, that person is called a wholesaler and have him come talk to you about why you should sell his funds. Listen, I don't think I would have made it in this business if I didn't have a great wholesaler. This guy, you know, taught me how to sell things. He'd come and say, hey, Dean, why don't you invite your prospects and clients to a seminar tonight? I'll come talk about professional management, diversification, 
ease of ownership. I'll pay for the uh, pizzas and the sodas. That's on me. I said, wow, you know, I never would have made it. By the way, he's got an expense account. He's, you know, knows what he's doing. So he could be a strategic resource. Uh, P.S., you know, you get tested on the maximum gift or gratuity rule. I bring it up here because this is where it comes up mostly. The maximum gift or gratuity that an employee of one member firm, the fund distributor, for example, can give to the employee of another firm And it's $100. Now that doesn't count normal deductible business activities like the seminar I just told that my co sale is going to pay for. And it doesn't count um, reminder advertising. Usually when a wholesaler comes in, we say, hey, what kind of Chotskis you got today? You know, you know, Franklin's great. They got coffee cups and golf balls and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. So it doesn't count normal deductible business activities. and it doesn't count reminder advertising. You know, I spent a lot of time with this guy. He's a, a wholesaler and he's taking his 24 and uh, you know, I'm helping him out. I said, listen, I'm gonna help you out. I'm not charging him for the, the help. I'm in, in just getting him past his exam. But anyways, uh, we spent a lot of time getting him through his 24. And when we got all done, he handed me a gift certificate for a hundred bucks. Now I know why he's carrying around gift certificates of hundred dollars because that's the maximum gift or gratuity. You know, and usually I'm sure what happens is when you wrote a uh, ticket, you did an investment in his fund, he probably would say, "Here's a hundred dollar gift certificate to your restaurant or whatever. Take your spouse out, and you know, thanks for the business." Anyways, I had to tell him, "Listen, I am not a, a employee of a broker dealer. That gift or gratuity rule doesn't apply to me. So if you're going to give me the hundred dollar gift certificate, why don't you just keep going?" <laughs> I'll tell you when the appropriate time to stop is. So that's their traditional business model that uh, the, the test has in mind, by the way. You know, you got to ride the horse in the direction it's going. I can't tell you how many people struggle with the idea that the test doesn't reflect what they're going to be doing. Well, welcome to the test. I mean, all these tests, very rarely are you taking a test that really is reflects any kind of reality what you may be doing. I joke, if we randomly took people who had passed their tests and made them retest, they'd go down in flames because you typically you know, develop whatever it is your niche is going to be as you progress through your career. All right, so we said the sponsor, underwriter, distributor, that's the person who's responsible for the, the fund shares, you know, that's a member of FINRA. They have a sell agreement with the other FINRA member firms. And if we don't have a selling agreement, you're not allowed to sell things or get people involved in things that aren't on your firm's approved product list. And so, you know, as a baby broker, that's not a derogatory term, by the way, it's a term of endearment. But as a baby broker, you probably should get comfortable with what's on the approved product list. You know, you might have wanted to do that, you know, I don't know how much time you have besides studying, but, you know, uh, I say you should have kind of a core couple products that you're familiar with that you can go out and uh, introduce yourself to the public with. Anyways, it must be in place to sell the investment company securities. You know, if you get people involved in a, an investment not sponsored by your employing broker dealer, it's called selling away. It's a strike three offense. Now that doesn't usually happen as it relates to selling some mutual fund. It has more often it happens with partnerships, but uh, what the, is testable and we're discussing now is that you can't get them people involved. By the way, you might even call the company that it doesn't have a selling agreement. Listen, a wholesaler would love this. Call up and say, hey, listen, I'd like to get people involved in your, your fund, but you're not on our approved product list. Can you come out and talk to compliance or whoever it is that's responsible? Uh, I didn't post it today. I usually try and post uh, articles that are relevant to testing, you know, current events with testable content, almost uh, posted today, but they said that uh, some firms aren't into this active ETF stuff. They're not allowing their brokers to get people involved in active ETFs because they're not comfortable with how they work yet. Well, oh, there you go, right? So if the fund my broker dealer tells me I can't sell active ETFs, well, then I can't sell active ETFs. Uh, shares were redeemed within seven days. I would definitely know that. You know, you have guaranteed marketability at the uh, next calculation of the NAV, and that's kind of a nifty thing to be able to do. We, you know, we have some investments, we have some investments where you don't have guaranteed marketability, right? You should definitely know, for example, partnerships don't have marketability, right? You can't get in or out. So shares redeem. Again, remember, customer says, well, Dean, how much money am I going to get when I put in my redemption request? I said, well, I don't know, because your redemption is going to be based on the next calculation of the NAV. And then we said, this is testable as well. We said this idea of $100 is testable.
breakpoints, a quantity discount. You know, breakpoints are quantity discounts. You know, I think of like Costco. When I go to Costco, I love Costco because they have quantity discounts. I go, man, I don't need two tons of salsa, but it's so cheap. <laughs> I wish other businesses were like ours. You know, one time I was in this hotel checking out and I said, is there any deal I don't know about? And they said, well, Dean, what do you mean? Is there any deal you don't know about? I said, well, I've been watching people check out and what people are paying is all over the place. This guy said, well, Dean, are you here on business? Or are you here on leisure? I said, well, you tell me what the rates are and I'll tell you why I'm here. He said, Dean, if you're here on business, it's $300 a night. But if you're here on leisure, it's $150. I said, well, gee, well, leisure it is. <laughs> so the easiest way to stay out of trouble here is to tell people how they get the best deal. So as you recall, we were looking at a fund that had the maximum load allowable of 8.5%. Not testable, but if you're charging somebody 8.5%, you got to give them the first break point at 50. That's not testable, but that's just the way the world is. I don't know if anybody's still charging 8.5%. So here's a breakpoint schedule. And so if you invest uh, in the fund, I guess I should have made that slide say one instead of zero. I don't know how you'd invest zero. Who knows, maybe you sign a letter of intent and you can still get in with zero upfront. But anyways, long story short, uh, eight and a half percent, 50,000 or more, you pay 6%. And obviously 6% is a better deal because if you paid six instead of eight and a half, you'd have more money going into the fund. You get more fund shares. That would be a better deal for you. And so I say, listen, if you'll invest $50,000 or more, you'll get a 6%. Now, assuming I didn't tell you this, very testable. You say, Dean, how much should I invest? I say, you want to invest $49,999. And you say, why? I say, because I'll make a, what, $4,250 commission instead of a $3,000 commission. Am I A, a full service broker or B, violating the code of conduct? I'd be violating the code of conduct. So be careful, giant read test. Breakpoints are good. Breakpoint sales are bad. Breakpoints are good. Breakpoint sales are bad. So you say, well, Dean, it looks like uh, I understand that I get a better deal if you know I come up with 50 grand, but for right now, all I got is 30 grand. All I have is 30 grand. I said, well, listen, do you think over the next 13 months, you might be able to come up with another 20? Because if you'll sign a letter of intent, telling the mutual fund that you intend to come up with 20 grand, not binding on you, just binding on them. We will charge you, the mutual fund will charge you 6% rather than eight and a half. And that means you'll have more money going into the fund. And uh, what they're gonna do is just escrow the additional fund shares. If you don't fulfill it, they're gonna back flag the account. So the key point is the customer cannot be hurt by filling out the letter of intent. Very testable, the letter of intent, the letter of intent is good for 13 months and it can be backdated 90 days. Both of those are test questions. So I'm your supervisor. I'm looking at your initial investment for 30 grand. And I say, hey, listen, good deal, I, good job. Did you tell them about the letter of intent? You say, oh man, I was so excited. It was my first mutual fund ticket and I forgot. I said, well, get your butt back out there. It's not too late because it can be backdated 90 days. Now that 90 days is inclusive of, <coughs> excuse me, inclusive of the 13 months. So, you know, 60 days have gone by. I call you to my office. I say, what's up? You know, where is that letter of intent? You said, Dean, I've been trying to track them down. I haven't been able to do so. I said, well, listen, they only have, you know, 30 days left on the 90 and then they're only gonna have 10 months. So that 90 days I would know is inclusive inclusive of the 13 months. So if you wait 90 days, you only got that. It's based on the dollars invested. You say, well, Dean, there's no chance I'm coming up with 20 grand. I say, well, do you think that within the, uh, sometime over your lifetime, you might come up with an additional uh, 20 grand? He goes, well, I hope so. I said, well, let's at least get you rights of accumulation. Now, what you have to be able to do on your exam is contrast a letter of intent with rights of accumulation. How are they different? Now with the 30 grand with no letter of intent and rights of accumulation, you're paying eight and a half percent and you're getting no rebate. But when you finally do cross the break point on that and all subsequent investment, you get the reduced sales charge. So rights of accumulation, no time limit, 
but you don't get the reduced sales charge on your initial investment. You get no rebate. Remember letter of intent? You say you're going to come up with the money. If you don't, it's not a problem because we just backflag the account. Now, another testable distinction is that with a letter of intent, it's got to be fresh money, new capital, not money we've made you that you've reinvested with a letter of intent. With rights of accumulation, growth counts. It can't be money that we've actually made for you and you're reinvesting. So uh, this slide is testable. You should definitely know everybody, by the way. As IAE, it shows up. It shows up everywhere. Seven, six, 65. That doesn't, well, it does show up on, to a certain extent, it shows up on 63 and uh, 66 because the state administrator wants to make sure you're disclosing breakpoints. Now, in this test, by the way, we don't assume the model is a no-load fund. No load fund. All right, so breakpoints are good. As I mentioned, RTFQ, breakpoint sales are bad. So if you know, I'm asking on the test, what about a breakpoint? You go, that's good. That's a quantity discount. That's a good thing. A breakpoint sale is a bad thing, right? So any person can receive the quantity discount, the breakpoint. Test question, not investment clubs. Uh, investment clubs are not allowed to pool their purchases for purposes of meeting the breakpoint. A lot of fund families have a combination privilege. For example, Franklin says, and I don't know if it's still true, but when I was selling Franklin funds, we don't care if you put 50 in the tax-free fund and 50 in the other corporate bond fund, junk bond fund, as long as you're combining purchases in the Franklin fund family are 100 grand. Yeah, that's a neat thing. I was teaching a, a 26 class in Boston where most you know mutual fund money, about 30 cents of every mutual fund dollar is managed out of Boston. But Anyways, the guy who was uh, in the 26 class said that he had an application that uh, didn't look suspicious in terms of breakaway. It was close, but it wasn't too close. He said, so I waived the breakpoint. I said, well, that was wonderful. He goes, Dude, you won't believe what happened. He said, the rep on the account called and cussed me out. He said, how dare I waive the breakpoint and reduce his sales charge, reduce his commission, because remember, that's what's going to happen. The reduced commission means the customer is going to be able to buy additional fund shares and I thought, woo, he said, yeah, Dean, at that point, I thought, well, maybe it isn't isolated. Perhaps there is a pattern. And so I pulled some more of his application and sure enough, a pattern emerged. He said, I called his manager and his manager called me back and said, hey, listen, we did some more homework and we found out not only was he doing it at your front fund, he was doing it at other funds. He was telling people that they need additional diversification amongst fund families, which is ridiculous. I mean, a bond fund is a bond fund is a bond fund. Uh oh, and then that's the rule, right? A breakpoint sale. A breakpoint sale is a violation. That's a big no-no. By the way, it's a big no-no under the Uniform Securities Act. It's a big no-no under the Code of Conduct. It's just a big no-no, right? Something we're not supposed to do. Uh, I pulled a couple of good questions uh, that uh, the FINRA SIE practice exam, I think V4 means version four of this thing. And so uh, I pulled a couple of questions appropriate to this topic. By the way, if you're not taking the SIE, who cares? Because it's the same testable content. There's a lot of overlap. So if it's not germane to all the exams, well, then I don't lecture the, 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 the lecture appropriately and I don't put it into the playlist for the various exams unless it's appropriate. You know, you 65s, if you're watching, I apologize, but there's certain lectures I have where, you know, I don't put them into your playlist because my God, they're like, you know, an hour, two hours and you get two points. So I don't think it's fair for me to do that. But, you know, when I lecture like this lecture, I'm gonna put this in the playlist for seven. Seven is always my dominant focus in terms of uh, the YouTube channel and the subreddit R series seven. That's what dominates. But again, I don't do that to the detriment of that. And so I'm telling you the SIE people, this is your question, but it will be on the seven too. So, you know, don't be, you know, fumbling around with like, oh man, does this for me or not for me? Uh, we had a question this morning on the subreddit. And I had somebody to ask me about regulatory settlement and accrued interest and an SIE candidate popped up and said, you know, is that a, what's, what do I need to know about that? I said the same thing. <laughs> so, no. Now, there was another guy who had a, a question on a credit call spread. I said, well, listen, USI, you should definitely tune out on that. But anyways, I like these uh, FINRA practice exams. If you're an SIE candidate, there would be a big sin not to go on to the uh, FINRA website and do this practice exam. It rotates the answers, same exam, it'll rotate it. I would do it two, three times. Uh, I've actually explicated it. If you go to my uh, YouTube channel, you'll see that I've actually explicated the whole exam. That means Basically, I like this question. I talk about what the right answer is and why the wrong answers are wrong and what they would have been right for. Uh, and I think, well, you should definitely take a chance to intellectual, do an inventory, intellectual inventory on that. Uh, P.S. I would tell you, all of you should always be doing intellectual inventories by doing practice exams. The biggest thing you can commit 
is not doing enough practice questions. All right, well, let's look at this one. Under normal circumstances, a customer's letter of intent on a mutual fund purchase is valid for what maximum period of time? That is very much a test question. Whoop. Uh, that is very much a test question. And as we said, it is 13 months. Oh, I'm having struggles here with my annotation tools. Boom. And then remember, uh, test question, it can be backdated for test question 90 days. And test question at 90 days is inclusive of the 13 months. So if you wait 90 days, then you basically got 10 months left, right? All right, well, class B shares. Now, a lot of mutual fund companies have gone back to the traditional A share because they just find this is too confusing to customers and to reps. And, you know, the biggest issue here is misuse of no load terminology, misuse of no load terminology. You know, somehow I'm being compensated to get you involved in the fund. And it's important that the customer understand how I'm being compensated. So in a class B share, back and load is still a load, right? If you come into my nightclub and I tell you it's free valet parking, and no cover charge. You go wonderful. You go in, you're having some fun, you're drinking some Cristal, and then you come out and I say, there's a $40 exit fee. And you say, well, Dean, you told me there's no cover charge. I said, there's not, there's an exit fee. And I said, but if you go back in there for another couple hours, drink some more, uh, you know, Cristal, or, you know, whatever your Amperion, whatever, bottle service. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, give your keys back to you. Probably wouldn't, probably can tell you you need to call Uber or Lyft, but Point being, that's still a load, and you should know that coming into the club, not going out of the club. So back and load a contingent deferred sales charge diminishes to 0% after five to seven years, and it converts to A shares. The biggest test point here is a contingent deferred sales charge is still a sales charge, and it needs to be described as such. The B shares have higher operating expenses because they're going to milk the thing to get their money out of there. It's suitable for smaller investments in the longer-term time horizon. A 12B1 fee is a promotional expense paid by the fund. So let me give you total misrepresentation, total misrepresentation. I say, listen, you don't pay me to get you involved in the fund. The fund pays me to get you involved. It's kind of like using your travel agent to book an airline flight or a hotel. You don't pay the airline, you don't pay the hotel. You know, who pays me the travel agent, your travel agent is the airline or the hotel. And that's how this mutual fund works. You know, this mutual fund works, you know, by uh, paying me to get you involved. Now, the reason that is misrepresentation is because your money is going into the fund and the promotional expense, not investment expense, not custodian, promotional expense is coming out. Now, the most you can charge as a 12B1 fee, a promotional expense, is three quarters of 1%, 75 basis points. If you want to sound like a player, you would uh, say BIPs, 75 BIPs. Now, here's the point about uh, three quarters of 1%. You know, you may have been better served to pay me the 4% or 3% of the Franklin Fund once and be done with me rather than paying me three quarters of 1% forever. Now, by the way, it might be worthwhile. I'd say, listen, give me full time for you watching your investments, and I'm worth that. Call me 2 a.m. during a market crash. I'm there for you. But again, that would be the max. Uh, C shares are suitable for shorter time and not less. A true no load fund, test question. I would definitely know a true no load fund can charge up to 25 basis points, 25 bips as a promotional expense. Vanguard doesn't do this, but Vanguard has like $3 trillion. They're a no load fund. And if Vanguard chose to, they could charge a one quarter of 1%, 25 basis points, 25 bips. Geez, on $4 trillion, that'd be a boatload of money and still refer to themselves as a no load fund. So I would definitely know this 25 basis points. This shows up a lot uh, on the SIE, on the six, the seven. Um, past that, you can't refer to yourself as a no load. I gave you a nice view here. So here's an example of a true no load fund. So here again is the hundred grand, the investor, right? And here is Vanguard. Vanguard is a no load fund. And 100% of that is going into that fund. As you can see, there's nobody in between the fund and the investor here. There's no fund distributor. There's no BD. It's you know right in there. Now, as I were saying here, this uh, no load fund could charge 25 basis points and still refer to themselves as a no load fund.
Die 90 is very testable. Die 90. Die 90 is a good way to remember this on your test. Die 90. You know, if we didn't have subchapter M or the conduit or pipeline theory, what would happen is the corporation would make money, for example, like Apple. Apple makes a profit, they pay a tax on the profit. Apple pays dividends. So it pays a dividend to the Apple shareholders and the shareholder is gonna pay tax on that. Now, as long as the mutual fund, if the mutual fund owns Apple, as long as the mutual fund passes through 90%, the IRS has been kind enough to say they will wait and get that from the mutual fund shareholder. If we didn't have that, by the way, it'd be triple taxation, right? Because you know Apple would make, make money, profit, pay taxes, pay a dividend to the fund, they'd pay taxes. The fund would be pay me and I'd pay taxes. Now here it's getting double tax. So the dividends from the stocks and the mutual funds portfolio, plus the interest on the bonds in the uh, in portfolio, whatever that is, at least 90. Now most mutual funds do much, much better than that. I mean, if they kept 10, uh, 9%, nobody would be in that fund because that would be not be tax efficient. And they'd have to be a very good argument about why they're keeping that money and thinking they could make more on it even after they pay taxes on it than just distributing it to us. So most funds do much, much better than this, but the minimum is 90%. That is a recognition test question. Not gonna make you crunch it, but die 90 is a good way to remember it. Now, before I turn the slide, there is another investment vehicle that's coming up on the next slide that works very similar. It too is going to pass through 90% of its net investment income. It too provides professional management, diversification, uh, needs of ownership. Please note, I didn't say mutual fund passes through losses. No, it just passes through income. What is that investment vehicle? That is, did you figure it out? A real estate investment trust, test question. Real estate investment trust provides professional management of real estate assets, you know, equity or even mortgages, uh, provide you diversification, like a mutual fund, more than one piece of real estate, more than one mortgage, whatever the case may be, easier to own than other ways to own real estate, like a partnership, for example, and it too, test question, will have a 90% pass-through. You know, for test purposes, REITs trade like stocks, like closed-end funds. You know, in San Francisco, there's a major office hotel retail hotel complex called the Embarcadero. The Embarcadero was formerly a partnership, and the partners in the uh, Embarcadero were the Rockefeller family. And the Rockefeller family had this uh, their assets tied up in this partnership called the Embarcadero in San Francisco. And they said they're going to sell, and they said, we're going to sell to a real estate investment trust. If you are re looking for trophy profit, you should make a, a, an offer. We don't want money. We don't want cash. We want, because that would be a taxable event. We want to exchange it for shares in your publicly traded REIT, because that'll give us some instant liquidity. Please make sure it's accretive to your earnings, because you know the appraised value of the Embarcadero is like $2 billion. And if we're going to take $2 billion in pieces of paper, shares in your REIT, we want to make sure it's a good deal for you. It's accretive because we're going to be sitting on the paper. Uh, long story short, the one who made the uh, winning uh, offer was uh, Boston Properties. BXP, it trades like a stock on the New York Stock Exchange. You know, when that deal was uh, done, uh, the Rockefellers took stock in Boston Properties, the REIT, at uh, $20 a share. And I said, good enough for the Rockefellers, good enough for me. So I thought 1,000 shares, BXP, just like buying my stock in my retirement account. And then when I walk through the Embarcadero, I say, I'm one of the owners too. I own 0.0000001%. Now, remember, it's diversified. They don't only own the Embarcadero. Boston property owns commercial real estate. I'll give you a guess. And what other city do you think they own commercial property? <laughs> Boston. And then they also own uh, some uh, commercial properties in New York. One of the disadvantages of a mutual fund is you lose tax control of your investments. The capital gains tax is a transaction-based tax. And the easiest way not to pay it is not to transact. You know, at the IPO price of $85 a share, Fidelity bought 10% of Google, not in one fund amongst the fund family. And to this day, Fidelity still owns 10% of Google. Now, if Fidelity sells the Google, there's going to be a huge capital gains distribution from the portfolio 
to the Fidelity Fund shareholders and they go taxes on that. Now, if I as an individual have bought a thousand shares of Google personally at 85, and now it's trading at where it's trading, I go, wow, you know, I'd like to sell that, but if I sell that, it's, it's over a million dollar position now. I'm in, I got a 915,000 plus capital gain that I'm gonna owe taxes on. And so while my investment mind might say sell, my tax mind says, you know, don't. Now, remember one of the disadvantages of mutual fund, I give up that, I don't, I don't get to make that decision. The portfolio manager does. The portfolio manager, I should say the portfolio manager, the investment advisory firm who hires a portfolio manager decides. They're the ones who are gonna decide when it's time to sell. You know, T. Rowe Price is, uh, you know, le legendary growth. They get upset with me when I visit them, but because, you know, I think of them as growth, but they go, damn, we do all kinds of things besides growth, but they're noted for growth. And, you know, they had a huge position in Tesla, made a lot of money on it, and they started liquidating that position in Tesla. So that means they're gonna be capital gains distributions to those T. Rowe Price uh, shareholders. And you know, remember, you're paying them to decide when it's time to buy or sell uh, Tesla. So the long-term capital gains distributions are no more than annually. It's taxable to the investor at the capital gains rate because it's based on how long the mutual fund has held it. So as you see here, it's based on how long the mutual fund has had it, not you, right? So it's, you know, the holding period of the mutual fund. And short-term only by the holding period of the fund. And we remember to qualify for a long-term capital gain. I would know that about all things, right? Long-term capital gains, you have to hold an investment for more than a year. Here would be the fund that's holding it. You know, Fisher Investments hates mutual funds. You know, hates them. And, you know, they tell you, well, hey, listen, if you come to Fisher, we'll create a portfolio for you that's more tax efficient. Uh, an investor, when you redeem, redemption is a taxable event. So when you decide to get out of the fund and redeem, that triggers a taxable event upon redemption. And now the difference when what you paid and what you receive is going to be what you're going to owe taxes on. And now on redemption, then it's going to be long-term or short-term based on how long you held the shares, how long the investor held those shares. Now test question, by the way, this is true whether it's mutual funds, but it happens more in mutual funds than other types of securities. You know, if you've been doing dollar cost averaging, for example, you know, and you're not selling all the shares or maybe you are selling all the shares, you have a choice about how to do this. You could do it first in, first out. That's what the IRS is going to assume. By the way, tax questions on your exams are very easy. You always guess what yields the most to the US Treasury. Whatever yields the most to the US Treasury, that is typically the right answer. So they, they give you a fact set and say, what's how are you gonna do this? I'm gonna show you how that plays out in just a little bit. You can do share identification, you can do average cost. Test question is, if you don't uh, keep good records, the IRS is gonna impose upon that upon you. And the reason is that would uh, typically generate a bigger tax. All right, so uh, let's try a practice question that uh, again, I pulled from FINRA, uh, the SIE practice exam version four. Again, I wouldn't put it in here if it wasn't appropriate for all parties. The redemption uh, value of an open-end mutual funds company shares is based on the previous offering price. <clears throat> the previous closing net asset value, and the next net asset value computed after the redemption request is received. Uh, listen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know every question is only worth one point, but if I were king and you missed this one, I would probably try, uh, you know, take more from you than just one point. What? Uh, I apologize, I'm having troubles with my, my tools here this morning. Um, but we won't let perfect be the enemy of the good. We're continuing to march. At some point, I'll go through and redo all the, the uh, lectures. Uh, listen, if you're listening to a lecture, who knows, I could have a brain fart or something. And if I say something that you're not sure about, you know, comments or send me uh, comments, I can fix it. And maybe I'll review it and say, yeah, you're right. I should have another cup of coffee. Don't know what I was thinking. But eventually, I'll go through and redo uh, all the lectures. Um, and I'll make sure, you know, my annotation's all perfect or okay, I'll do a take two. <laughs> I do sometimes do a take two, but it, it has to be pretty bad for me to, to stop and start over or whatever, because I'm trying to get as much content to you as I, I possibly can in the shortest period of time. But for example, the first two lecture option lectures are one two hour lecture. That should have been two separate one hour lectures, but I kind of got through the first hour and just kept marching. So 
I figure you have a pause button, so you know you can pause and reset and whatever. But anyways, I would take more than uh, two points from you here because this is just you know point blank a test question. So you should definitely know uh, what is that called? Remember what that's called? Very testable. That's called forward pricing. Uh, let's tell you what, let's get out of it. That's important enough to get ourselves a text box. And let's get us a good color here and let's get us good font and we're always doing business based on the next calculation of the Navy. Uh, let's see, D, offering price computed after redemption request. No, remember it's based on the NAV, it's not based on the offering price. Remember NAV plus sales charge equals public offering price known as the POP. So no, no, no. Uh, very testable, very testable. Let me clean up my slide here. This is very testable. So a couple of test questions here. Uh, first test question is what makes this work? And you got to say, what makes dollar cost averaging work is fixed dollars invested regularly. Now, this makes a lot of sense because most people don't get like a hundred grand to drop in the stock market. Most people, you know, can invest like they get money, drips and drabs, right? So I say, hey, listen, how much can you, uh, you know, put into this mutual fund? Can you give me $50 a month or $100 a month or $100 a quarter? So that's our first test question. What makes dollar cost averaging work? fixed dollars invested regularly. So here we go. We're going to invest $100 every quarter. <laughs> I was talking to this guy once and I said, how'd you end up here? I mean, the guy's, you know, he arrived at his financial destination with looking pretty damn good. And he said, well, Dean, I uh, was in Korea. I said, I don't get it. And when I got out of the Korean war, uh, you know, I joined the credit union. I said, I still don't get it. He said, Dean, I got a shared secured loan to make my, to buy a car. And I had the car payment coming out of my paycheck. And I said, I still don't get it. He said, then I got a mortgage, Dean. I had the car payment and the mortgage payment coming out of my check there at the credit union. I said, I still don't get it. He said, well, Dean, once I got the car paid for, I was used to the money coming out of my check. And so I just said, uh, put that in a mutual fund. Now, listen, good news for him. There wasn't a you know, whole hundred thousand different mutual funds at the time for him to do that. I mean, I joke, we probably could have messed him up with some kind of a financial plan of some sort. But anyways, he said, I got used to making the mortgage payment. So I told him to take the mortgage payment, the car payment, and put it in the mutual fund. So you ended up dollar cost averaging uh, for over the course of many years. Now, if you believe there's an upward bias in the economy, that's gonna be kind of a no brainer. Uh, please note, please note, he's combining a savings discipline with some risk in a good way. I mean, if he would have just taken you know, the car payment and his mortgage payment and put it in a traditional savings account, yeah, I'm not sure he would have ended up in the same place. You know, what I'm saying is that we do want you to take risk in your investments because we're trying to get you somewhere. Our heart's on the right spot. Now, how much risk he's comfortable with would be a different thing, right? But anyways, the first thing that makes it work, fist dollars invested regularly. Second test question, what will be the end result? You will have a lower average cost than those of the underlying shares. So let's just look at that. As you see here, let me get out my text box, uh, lower average cost. So I have uh, spent $400. And that $400, I've acquired 10 five, 10, five. So I've acquired 30 shares in this mutual fund. And let me get out my calculator. And I'm gonna take uh, $400. I'm gonna divide by the 30 shares. And I find out that my average cost, what, uh, $400 divided by 30 shares is 1333. Uh, 10, 15, 30, I've invested $400. Looks like the math here. Uh, $400 divided by 30 shares. It looks like I should have a, a calculator's kind of acting up here. Uh, the average share price is 750 and my cost is going to be 666. So please know that I ended up here with an average cost higher. It doesn't guarantee a pro profit. So that's our third test question. In fact, let me just fix this. I'll fix this later. It looks like I got an exhibit here that's kind of messed up. But anyways, the, the last thing is you don't end up with guaranteeing a profit. You can lose money dollar cost averaging. So three test question, what makes it work? Fixed dollars. Oh, I see what I did wrong. Uh, let's see here. Not good when you're uh, 
I was taking the pot. That's not what I should be doing, right? What I should be doing here. So I get, if I invest 100, I get 10 shares there. And let's see, I got it five. I'm going to buy 20 shares. P.S. Please know I'm doing exactly what I should be doing, which is buying more shares when they're low and less shares when they're high. That's exactly what I should be doing, right? If you went into the supermarket and they kept raising the prices on you, you would cut back on your purchases. It's only in situations like GameStop where people feel like buying more comfortable buying at higher and higher prices rather than buying at lower and lower prices. All right, so let's try this again. So I have invested uh, $400 and now I have, let's see, I got 10 shares, I got 20 shares, 10 shares, 20 shares. I've bought 60 shares with my money. And that means, let's get my calculator out here, $400. Uh, divide by 60 shares. And I find out my average cost is 666. That's my average cost. Whoop. Okay, let's see what the uh, let's see what the average of the shares have been. So now I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take what uh, these should, are here: ten uh, plus uh, five uh, plus ten plus five. As I mentioned, the vast majority of the test is division. So let's see. Uh, that's 30, and I'm gonna divide by four. Where's my divide? There we go. And the average share price has been 750. And that was test question number two. Uh, test question number uh, two is I end up with a lower average cost than those of the underlying shares. My average cost here is uh, 666 and the average uh, price has been 750. And that's test question number two. Uh, test question number three doesn't guarantee a profit. As you see here in the example I just did with you, you presently have uh, 60 shares. And I just gave you an example here that are uh, priced at $5 on the public offering price. So you have an account now that's worth $300. You paid $400 and you have a $300 mutual fund account. So that's our third test question, doesn't guarantee a profit. So test question, what makes it work? Fixed dollars invested regularly. Test question number two, what's the end result? You end up with a lower average cost than those of the underlying shares. Test question number three, doesn't guarantee a profit. Boy, if you combine this with a 401k pre-tax, woo, <laughs> then you're really cooking. Uh, mutual fund suitability, boy, we better be able to say it in our sleep. Past performance is not indicative of future results. You know, suitability in mutual fund is kind of like online dating, right? We need to know whether we're going to swap right or swap left. If there's going to be a match or not going to be a match. Because what I'm trying to do is match my investors' uh, investment objective with that of the fund. As you remember, we said that part of the Investment Company Act of 1940 is that the mutual fund has to have a clearly defined investment objective. And so we have growth stocks and therefore we have growth funds. You know, growth funds, again, I have the growth stock. stocks that typically don't pay uh, dividends. They're taking whatever resources they have and reinvesting in the business. You know, the two top growth funds last year, both had a big position in Zoom. Ended up being one of the best growth stock uh, stories of that year. And therefore that carried through in the NAV and the performance of their fund. And if we looked in the fund, we'd see other stocks like Zoom, other growth stocks. You know, growth stocks, I would note, are typically stocks that pay little or no dividends. We'd be in it for price appreciation. The only two ways you're going to make money in an investment is income stream and or price appreciation. Now, we also have uh, funds that invest in uh, income. Uh, income here, we mean from stocks that pay dividends. So it could be an income fund or it could be an income fund that has bonds. But, you know, so we, the two ways you make money is income stream and price appreciation. Now, if you're looking for both, that's called total return. 
So that'd be a fund that has some, you know, grow stocks and also has some mature stable corporations that are, are paying dividends. And those two things together are called total return. So we're trying to get both some growth and some income. Uh, Tax-free income buys muni bonds, right? So muni bonds would, uh, again, now be careful on the, the tax-free fund that owns the municipal bonds. You know, the coupon payments, the semi-annual interest payments, the fixed or stated rate of return. The nominal yield, that is what gets passed through as a dividend. But since that dividend from that tax-free fund is coming from muni bonds, that is tax-free. We have specialized or sector funds. They're diversified, but only within their specialty or sector. I brought up, for example, the Mexico fund. It's diversified, but only within Mexico. Test question, the specialty funds, let me get a different color, are the most aggressive funds we have. They typically have higher volatility. I had a guy who's, he's a guy who does out, goes out, and talks to employers, uh, employees of employers who have 401ks at their mutual fund family. And uh, his job is to go out and talk to him about the funds. And he told me that he had a guy who came up to him at the break and said he wanted to retire in five years. Which fund should he pick? And he said, I asked him, well, how much has he already got, you know, put aside? Has he got invested? He said, nothing. And I said, well, what'd you tell him? He said, I told him he ought to buy a, a lottery ticket because we test question don't have a fund with a high enough beta to get you from there to there. So test question, typically a specialty or sector fund would have a higher beta than other funds. Now, very testable, whether it's a mutual fund, whether it's other areas, other exams, but beta is a measurement, this is very testable, of a stock or fund, in this case funds, volatility, as compared to the market as a whole. A measurement of the stocks or funds volatility as compared to the market as a whole. As compared So if I told you that this uh, fund has a beta of two, that means it's twice as volatile as the underlying market. So if the market goes up 10%, this thing should go up 20%. You know, if it didn't, by the way, it had underperformed. You know, goes down 10%, this thing should go down 20%. It's twice as volatile. What would be the beta on an index fund? One, right? The S&P 500 uh, Vanguard fund, whatever the market does, that's what it does. Now, if my customer tells me that he doesn't like the idea of this monkey eating too many bananas, he says, Dean, to be honest with you, I'm a believer in, test question, the efficient market hypothesis. Now, that's not true. That's just a way of explaining things. And the more a theory or hypothesis can explain, the better that theory or hypothesis is. But the efficient market hypothesis says it's really a waste of resources to do active management and try and outperform the market. You know, and there's strong forms of this. And there's weaker forms of this, but you know, basically, you say, you know, Mr. Buffett is a statistical anomaly, and you know, I should just put my money and accept a market-based return. And you know, by the way, John Bogle is a legendary guy. I always read all his uh, books he's passed on. But you know, even Mr. Buffett, before he uh, you know had passed on, and afterwards, has said that you know, when he uh, you know his estate plan that his heirs should diversify into an index fund. <laughs> so, anyways, test question here is suitability. So my customer says, Dean, I'm interested in uh, the lowest cost possible. I am okay with the risk involved in the market. I am okay with systematic risk, the tendencies of securities and prices to move get together up or down. And so I'm just willing to accept the market. Whatever the market will give me, that's what I'll take. Thank you very much. Well, then again, I would recommend test question and index fund. So remember, this is a suitability question. Uh, suitability questions can be challenging. You know, if you have some thoughts, uh, send it to me because um, I know I have somebody testing soon and they said, Dan, when you do a suitability lecture and I, I'm contemplating it, I got a couple slides going. I'm just like, I can't in my own mind think about what's the best way to attack that kind of a can of worms. Uh, but I can tell you this, uh, one thing you can do is if you know the products very well, if you know the products very well, the investment vehicles, 
determining suitability and what driver goes into the vehicle or not, right? That's that analogy, right? It becomes easier. And so sometimes it's by process of elimination. You can typically in a suitability question, get rid of something you know is clearly unsuitable, you know, and you can get it to a 50-50. And then even there, there's truly, I miss some of those judgment questions because, you know, I'm a biased equity guy. So, you know, you know, they're going to give me a question like the guy's 90 years old and what should he be in? I'm going to say he should have, a, you know, his 100% of his assets into a micro cap stock. I'm joking. <laughs> By the way, if you are that kind of person, then you should definitely tell them. All right, very testable again, very testable again. So, you know, we have money market funds. So if somebody needs their assets to be liquid, you know, maybe we put them in a traditional bank account we have available, but we also have money market funds. This was pretty scary in March. Uh, a lot of people didn't even want to be in money market funds. They were receiving all kinds of redemption requests and they weren't able to sell the commercial paper and the bankers acceptances and you know, the other things, because the market was freezing up every, any, uh, the only thing people wanted was uh, treasury bills, you know, and the Fed good news stepped in exigent circumstances and started providing some liquidity. But what's found in a money market fund, very testable, is high quality debt maturing in less than 12 months. So my customer says, Dean, what's on a money market fund? I say, oh, that was on my exam. It's high quality debt maturing in less than 12 months. And they say like what? And I say, oh, that was on my test two. That was on my test two. Like, oh, I don't like any of those colors. But let's do that one. We haven't done that one wrong. Uh, like, very testable, commercial paper. Well, let's start with well, let's start with the best one. Let's start with the, the highest quality thing you can ever have, which is a T-bill. You know, T-bills are issued at a discount. They have the full faith and credit of the United States government. So T-bills would be in there. Uh, what else would be in there? Commercial paper. Uh, commercial paper, by the way, issued at a discount, 270-day max maturity. You know, I, I find it fascinating. I just, you know, I'll have to go on a little rant here. I can't believe some people in the subreddit are correcting yours truly about what's on the Series 7 or not when all they're doing is studying. And I've literally helped thousands of people to take and pass these exams, NASA and FINRA. And sometimes I, I'm trying to be nice because, you know, you know, I'm the moderator, but, you know, anyways, I was telling somebody commercial paper, they do need to know it's issued and trades at a discount. And then, you know, they said they have an inkling that it, that's not true. That's not what's testable. And I said, well, that means you don't understand mutual funds because it has to be something that's tradable because they got to meet redemption requests. In fact, I just gave you an example in March where that became very meaningful. <laughs> so, and then what is it? It's large unsecured borrowing by corporations. Uh, you also need to know about bankers acceptances. I don't know why that shows up on every exam. Uh, again, this isn't an, a, a lecture about money market securities, but I'm giving you what's in the, that I'm trying to make these lectures as target rich as possible. And bankers acceptances test question you should know are used to facilitate foreign trade. They too are issued at a discount. Uh, they too have a max maturity of 270 days. If you want more than that, you can, that's the test question. I'm more than happy. I've also been accused of providing too long and too elaborate uh, explanations, but you know, that's my thing. I've decided that that's going on. I'm going to put my flag. Yes, that is true. I'm not giving you, you know, the one liners. Uh, anyways, the uh, other one that's on here is negotiable jumbo CDs. And a negotiable means it has a secondary market, which we said is important because we have to meet redemption requests. And jumbo means $100,000 or more. And so those all would be found in a money market fund. Very testable. Now on your Uniform Securities Act test, your 63, 65, 66, I would also know that money market securities, not money market funds, be real careful. A money market fund has to comply with the Investment Company Act of 1940. But money market securities that are sold to fund managers who are capable of protecting their own assets, their own interests, are exempt from registration under the 33 and the Uniform Securities Act. Because, you know, they're not being sold to Joe Sixpack uh, retail investors. So bonus question for you. Uh, then again, suitability. Uh, people need their money to be liquid. They sometimes like to say uh, they have this question. And I think Past Perfect, SDC Capital all have a version of this question that a lot of people encounter on suitability about uh, somebody. This is from the exam. And then we all try and reverse engineer a question like it. 
but uh, she's being transferred to a new neighborhood, new across the country. She sold her house in California. She's sitting on a bunch of cash. She's uh, investigating, doing her due diligence, trying to find out what neighborhood she wants to be in. And then she's going to buy a house. And they make it kind of clear, you know, in the situation that she needs her money to be liquid. And so what might we recommend? Well, what might we recommend is a money market fund. Or again, remember, we also can recommend a traditional bank account. A uh, balance fund, we could have, you know, balance of stocks and bonds. We could do asset allocation and then reorganize that asset allocation, rebalance it based on whatever end of the year, you know, if our growth fund went up, we can, you know, reallocate it. Uh, bond funds, be careful. A bond fund is the one time that the fund can actually be more dangerous, the individual security. What I mean by that is you recall when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And so in a bond fund, if interest rates go up, the NAV is going down. Now, if this was a, a bond I had, you call me and say, hey, Dean, I'm got my statement, I get my statement every quarter and I'm looking at my bonds and they've gone down. I said, well, what do you care? You're not participating in the secondary market. So what do you care? What you care about is if you hold them to maturity, you are immune from that. You know, an immune bond portfolio is a bond portfolio where we're just buying bonds and holding them to maturity. You know, but in a bond fund, if it hasn't been sold pro properly as a long-term investment, what happens is some people might get willy nilly and start redeeming, causing my manager to have to sell. And then we might be able to realize it, might realize that loss. Yeah, you know, these guys in class, they came up and said, Dean, we have this uh, presentation we use when selling bond funds. I said, oh, I'm always into a good presentation. Tell me what it is. We said, we go out and tell people how would they like to get nearly double the current CD rate with government guaranteed safety? I said, whoa, man, you know, uh, my compliance, you know, Spidey sense is already going off. You know, you're comparing two things that aren't alike out of the gate. I mean, you know, what are you talking about? And they said at the time, at the time when they were telling me this, CDs paid two and the government securities fund was paying four. I said, well, listen, I don't know if you guys are malicious or ignorant, but that's misrepresentation. I mean, I may not be very sophisticated, but if I buy a 2%, $100,000 CD, I may not understand a lot of things, but I understand I'm getting back 102 and I don't have any investment risk. You said, well, Dean, they got government guaranteed safety. I said, well, yeah, but they put that into a bond fund. Is there a load? Nothing wrong with the load. They said, well, yeah. I said, what is it? And they said, 4%. I said, okay, so now I got 9,600 that goes into your bond fund. And they said, yeah. I said, and interest rates go up and my NAV goes down and now I got nine grand. I'm going to be mad. Anyways, they come back the next day and they told me their supervisor told them that that's OPK because as the NAV goes down, the yield goes up. I go, well, gee, in theory, you got 0% principal yielding 100,000. The current, 100%, the current yield is only rising based on the lower price for new people coming into the fund. So be careful on that. Uh, listen, I would have gone after this broker for failure to supervise uh, his manager. He took the little old lady's 47 grand. That's odd, by the way, just that it's 47 and bought her one junk bond that then defaulted. Can't believe that. I mean, he could have bought her 47 grand in the Franklin H. High Income Fund, for example. Right. Another reason you would want to buy a bond fund is you're going to be diversified in terms of credit risk. So you have in bonds in general, you have interest rate risk and credit risk. But here, you know, you can diversify in a corporate bond fund by saying, I only want high credit quality bond fund or low, medium and high quality, or I want to have a diversified portfolio of junk bonds, high yield bonds, thinking they're all going to default at one time. Right. Uh, municipal bond funds, comparatively low yield, high safety. You know, municipal credit is considered the second safest form of credit after the U.S. government. As we said, the dividends are tax exempt, the capital gains are taxable. You know, I was uh, in the municipal lecture, you know, somebody had commented and on the Reddit we were talking. I, I don't know who he really is. I think it's, someday I'll ask him, why are you a salty dog? <laughs> Anyways, he said, Dean, when you again, when you were doing tax-free bonds or tax-free funds, I said, I used to sell a lot of the Franklin tax refund and you know, the manager at the time was a guy named Raphael Costas. And, you know, when I was tutoring that 24 guy, he said that he'd retired a couple of years back. And, but he was the man back when I was selling him. And here's one thing I loved about Raphael. You know, uh, one time he was on the dais with these other bond fund managers, tax-free managers. All of them agreed that there were undervalued bonds in the secondary market, municipal bonds. All of them were buying them. And then they were talking to the other two guys on the dais about how they sell them. And they also get a capital gain get some upside as well as that tax-free income. And when it got to Raphael, he said, 
Uh, no, I don't do that. I'm trying to minimize the capital gains distributions from the tax-free fund. It's kind of boring, but I told people I'm just going to hold the bonds to maturity because we're trying to minimize the capital gains distributions from the tax-free fund to the customers. So we typically don't sell the bonds. I mean, you know, if it's a good enough price, yes. But in general, we're just going to buy and hold. It creates less transaction costs. I thought, man, finally, I'm Andrew who sticks to, sticks to a stipulated investment objective. And those days, as I was uh, talking to the guy in the uh, subreddit, you know, uh, I was a retail broker and I made like a thousand reprints of that and used it in prospecting and talking to my clients, say, here's our guy. Here's the guy who's, you know, making these decisions for us. Doesn't he look like a quality guy? Uh, who knows who the new guy is? I mean, the guy before him was a guy named Dave Dewerson. So he probably retired many, many years ago. Let me clean up the slide. Uh, by the way, I just remind you, you know, different issue, different lecture, but to determine whether the guy should be in the corporate bond fund or the muni bond fund, do you remember how you do that in terms of suitability? By way of reminder, you would take the corporate bond, the taxable yield, and times it by 100% minus the tax bracket. Or you take the muni bond and divide that yield by 100% minus the tax bracket. Different lecture. But you know, suitability, it could be instead of an individual bond, it could be this scenario as well. So I told you about money market funds. We allow you to access the money market fund by get, uh, hooking you up with a checkbook. And then when you write a check, you know, we typically uh, redeem whatever shares we need to clear your check. They're uh, no load, they're managed for a fixed NAV of a buck. Boy, I told you, March got scary. Uh, March, we had some money market funds that look like retail funds, which is really bad. It looked like they might break that buck. And that's we had that during the financial crisis. It's a huge, huge thing. We have mortgage-backed securities funds. So, you know, as many different individual securities we have, that's how many different mutual funds we have, right? You know, I personally think 80, 90% of what you need to be done can be done with a mutual fund. I mean, you know, if you, I, I wouldn't feel sorry if you have a six and all you have is a six because in theory, you could conduct all of your business with a six and 63. You know, maybe if you want to get some, you know, fee-based income, maybe combine that with a 65. Uh, well, I say, listen, for me to do a really good job for you over time, I need to know a lot about you. The more I know about you, the better I'm going to be in determining suitability. So, you know, I'd like to read you a list of investment objectives. I'd like you to rate them on a scale of one to 10, 10 being very important, one not important at all. You know, safety of principle, 10. You know, uh, tax free income, 10. You know, growth, negative two. I mean, I'm joking. But based on the investor's objective would help me determine what kind of fund might be right for them. Now, a lot of your study materials have some exercises on this, and I highly recommend you uh, complete those exercises. I like to start with process of elimination by recognizing what that objective would not be appropriate for. And I told you by process of elimination, you can typically get it to a 50-50. Uh, I'm thinking about organizing, you know, again, I'm struggling with this, so you could be helpful. I'm thinking I might do the suitability lecture I have in mind by doing explicating a suitability set of questions. Kind of like what I've done in the series seven practice finals and I've done on the SIE. So again, if you have thoughts, uh, send them my way. So, you know, we can try and get that. I think she's testing, the person requested that lecture is testing the end of the month. So I'm probably gonna make a go of it and then maybe I'll just say, you know, if this doesn't work, we'll do another take of it. <laughs> We talked about the fund's performance. We said very much in your sleep, you better be able to say, past performance is not indicative of future results. Now, the load isn't the only thing we could uh, consider, but it's a consideration, right? The expense ratio, I kind of joked about this. How much of the money is getting eaten up, right? How much of the bananas are the monkeys eating? Again, it's not the only measure of comparison, but it's a, a comparison, right? You know, I kind of joke like a charity, right? A charity with a lower expense ratio is leaner and meaner, got more money to going to what it is that they're trying to accomplish. It's not the only way I'm gonna decide, you know, uh, how to spend my, uh, invest my money or give my money to, but that's important. We said the investment advisor management or experience the tenure. So I brought this up, right? Are they using a team approach? I, I bet Franklin might take exception with Dean focusing on Raphael or Dave Dewerson or Mark Mobius, star managers. I mean, American Fund certainly frowns on that. They say we are a team oriented. T. Rowe. But again, if we have a, a legendary guy like Peter Lynch at Fidelity, for example, or, or you know, Jeffrey Vinnick from Fidelity, 
as these legendary managers go, oh, Bill Gross recently, all right? Bill Gross, well, I say recent compared to my career, but, you know, he uh, was the founder of, uh, you know, PIMCO and, you know, he quit one day and then he went over to Janus and, you know, uh, when he left the house, they received, I thought this was very impressive. They received $38 billion in redemption requests. I thought for sure they were going to ask the SEC for permission to suspend meeting redemption requests, but they, unbeknownst to Bill, had a secret plan. They wanted him to quit because, you know, they had like a $400 million bonus pool and, you know, he would eat 380 right? So anyways, when he left to go to Janus, the fund he went to manage over at Janus immediately went up 500 million. And we thought that was the money from Pemco Redemption's following him. Come to find out it was just Bill's money. So uh, he's recently retired. Uh, ease of ownership. We talked about all these. You have a choice of investment objectives. You can switch. I told you that guy who told me he was too sophisticated. His broker told him he was too sophisticated for a mutual fund. He said, Dean, I think I'll buy this tax refund. And then later on, maybe I could switch the objective when my investment objective changes or, you know, maybe when I pass on. I said, now, when you pass on, they're going to step up at the basis. That's going to be a, a taxable event. But I get what you're saying. We said it's convenient. You have liquidity. You have guaranteed marketability at the next calculation of the NAV. We said, you're going to get that in seven days. We said, you have a low minimum initial investment of $500 is common. As I said, I wouldn't be surprised that I, you tell me I found a fund that's lower than that. I wouldn't be surprised. We said fund families have combination privileges. Uh, fund families sometimes let you go from fund A to fund B. I would let you uh, know, test question, if you go for, change funds within the fund family, assuming your mutual fund is in your retirement account, because then, you know, it's a whole different scenario. But if it's in your personal account, that's going to be a taxable then. You know, I had somebody in class, they, said, Dean, when I got licensed, they gave me some orphaned accounts. I said, well, that was nice though. He said, yeah, and this person had a huge capital gain in this growth fund. I said, why don't we get out of the growth fund, put it in the money market and then redeploy the capital. And he said, they were mad when they found out that that created for them a $40,000 tax. I said, well, I'd be mad too. Now, nobody expects you to be a tax person. In fact, I'm supposed to say, listen, I'm not your tax professional. I'm not your legal professional. I'm your investment guy. I'm the idea guy. But I should have a general understanding of how my recommendations impact taxes, right? So if you go for exchange fund A for fund B within the same fund family, assuming we're not in a retirement account, it's gonna be taxable. Uh, we talked about some of these, there's a tendency market risk of securities move together. That's called systematic risk, systematic risk. We talked about an interest rate expense. We said our interest rate risk, we said, if you have a bond fund, interest rates go up, the NAV is going down. And then remember this from our bond lecture, if interest rates go down, the NAV goes up, but perhaps the bonds in the portfolio can start getting called away. You have an expense risk, meaning that they can raise the expenses. The expense structure of the investment can change. And we talked about tenure risk, that you know, you're in this uh, fund because of the manager and then the manager leaves and goes somewhere else. All right, I pulled this from Finner. Uh, which of the following responses describes the advantage of a mutual fund? Protection of principle during a bear market ain't flunk the entire exam. Your seat should just shoot you into the ceiling and say, I don't know what you were thinking about. You know, if somebody says, is my capital at risk? We should say yes. If you're not comfortable with that, you shouldn't be in the securities markets. You know, I had this guy who was thinking about making an exception for him. You know, I don't usually let, you know, do business with people. But I said, John, I said, how are you going to feel if you lose this hundred grand? He said, Dean, I'd kill myself. So then you don't belong in securities markets and securities products. You need to talk to your insurance agent about a traditional insurance product where your capital is not at risk or your banker about a traditional banking product where your capital is not at risk. In traditional insurance uh, products and traditional banking products, the investment risk, Johnny, is assumed by the insurance company or the bank. But in the securities markets, your capital is at risk. So if it's a bear market, you could lose your money. So that is not an advantage. B, high turnover to take advantage of market opportunities. That's not an advantage. I mean, it's kind of cool to be able to do that, but you know, uh, so high turnover, higher management fees do, oh, I got a typo there. That's a say fees due to active management. Uh, lower management, right? Describes the advantage of, by the way, sounds like I should have put index fund in here. Lower management fees due to passive management. So, you know, there's either an index fund or a UIT. Which of the following communications with the public is considered uh, misleading? Historical illustrations based on factual performance. Again, I pulled this from the SIE. Uh, that sounds reasonable. That sounds okay. 
keyword, historical. Product comparisons that illustrate material differences. That sounds like something I should do. A research report that includes a buy recommendation. That sounds reasonable. Uh, D, literature providing 10-year performance to support predictions of the future. Ding, ding, ding. D would be inappropriate misleading. I'm supposed to say, I don't know anything about the future. My crystal ball is broke. So I don't know anything about that. So D, you know, we should never start going into the future. Past performance is not indicative of future results. All right. So uh, there's a lot of things that mutual funds people didn't like. And so what you have to be able to do on your exam is contrast an ETF with an open-end fund. So that's what you got to be able to do. So exchange traded funds, test question, are continuously priced. They trade like a stock. So exchange traded funds, they trade like a stock. So that's kind of cool. So you're not waiting for the next calculation of the NAV. You get the, again, asset allocation immediately by just stepping into the market and buying the appropriate ETF. You know, Reg T says you can't buy new issues on margin. And it's considered a new issue 30 days from the effective date. Remember, open-end funds are continually offering new shares to the public. And so that means you can't buy an open-end fund on margin, right? Here, ETFs can be purchased on margin. So new issues can't be purchased on margin. An open-end fund is a new issue. And it's considered a new issue 33 days from the effective date. Be careful. That means if you've owned the open-end fund fully paid for, for 30 days, you can deposit it and borrow against it, but that's a different issue. So what you got to be able to do is how are ETFs different than an open-end fund? You can't sell short an open-end fund, but you can sell short an ETF. You can borrow it and sell it. ETFs are passively managed, so they typically have lower expenses. That means they're a little more efficient on the cost structure, whereas actively management uh, funds have an investment advisor and have higher expenses. And ETFs are, are more tax efficient because, again, they're passive. They're not buying and selling securities. Whereas the open end fund, remember, is buying and selling. I gave you an example of Fidelity. And if they sell the Google stock, they're going to use a huge capital gains distribution. And the mutual fund shareholders are going to get the distribution of taxes on that. Uh, not true of an ETF. We don't expect they're going to be selling securities. So you have to be able to contrast ETFs. The one that shows up most on the test is the number one there, that ETFs trade like a stock. ETNs. Uh, Everybody gets at least one question on ETN. So here you go. Um, I think, you know, they've been talking about changes. The ETFs, the ETF actually has physical custody of the assets. You know, if you buy the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, BlackRock Gold uh, ETF, they, they do have physical custody of the gold somewhere. You know, if you buy the uh, Spider, you know, State Street, they, you know, have those securities. Those securities are custodied and, in the exchange traded fund, the securities actually exist. So if I'm a bank and I want to get involved in this game, I say, man, to actually buy these portfolios and actually custody them and then, you know, buy and sell and rebalance. Oh my goodness, I don't have the expertise. It's a lot of work. You know, instead, why don't I just issue an exchange traded note? And I tell the note holder that uh, if you buy my exchange traded note for the S&P 500, for example, in five years, I will give you whatever the S&P has done. So you give me 100 grand, you buy the exchange traded note. And in five years, when it comes due, the market has doubled, the bank will give you 100, uh, 200 grand. Wow. Now, they don't actually own the S&P 500. So that's an entirely different proposition. So exchange traded notes on security. So all you have is the bank, the sponsor, the sponsor is a financial institution, their guarantee. Now, there's been somewhere these things have blown up. I mean, the guarantee is only good as the guarantor. You know, I personally wouldn't have a problem if an ETN was issued by JP Morgan or, you know, Bank of America, but, you know, some bank I never heard of, and maybe I do. We said it has a maturity date and the holder is a creditor. That's the test question. You know, you don't own the underlying assets. In an ETF, you actually own proportion ownership of a real portfolio somewhere. Uh, not so in an ETN, so you're a creditor. Uh, here's the question I pulled from, uh, FINRA's SIE practice exam. I kind of like this one. It says, which of the following uh, products is adversely affected, adversely affected by the issuer's credit rating being downgraded? Well, the, it doesn't matter about a mutual fund, right? Because it's not, the issuer is, isn't is promising you anything. They're, the issuer is actually just uh, buying securities with the stuff. They have those securities. Remember, there's a custodian, 
Not a problem. A uh, unit investment trusts uh, have passive management. And it's typically a fixed portfolio. So the underlying assets have been professionally selected. Uh, but you know, there again, there's no, there's no, you know, creditor relationship here. Uh, Nuveen in uh, Chicago, uh, I used to sell a lot of these as a baby broker. You know, what they would do is professionally select, select muni bonds, a fixed portfolio of municipal bonds. And then I'd say, how would you like to own proportion ownership in this uh, bond portfolio? These bonds have been freshly selected. As an owner of this unit investment trust, California Tax-Free Trust 186, as the bonds pay interest and mature, that will be distributed to you. Now, there's nobody here to pull the, the weeds if there's a weed in this thing. So you're buying a fixed kind of portfolio with passive management. The cost structure is a little lower, but at the end of the day, it's not a creditor relationship you have with, uh, in this case, Nuveen. Exchange traded funds, we said no. Exchange traded funds, we said actually do own and have custody of the underlying assets. Ding, 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 an ETN. So I would definitely know that about an ETN. Let me clean up my slide here. Let me go down here. D. All right, well, it looks like we came in at a little bit under two hours. Uh, again, um, trying to get as much up there as possible on the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, like, uh, share, subscribe, uh, comment. Uh, if you're on the YouTube channel, please subscribe. Uh, share with other candidates. If you are on the, uh, I guess I should look up at you guys are looking at. If you are on the subreddit, if uh, you're already there, but if not, you can find us as a community on uh, r backslash series seven that's the subreddit and uh next lecture i'll put a poll up we usually are doing it by polls so i'll put up a poll at whatever the next lecture is we'll try to get up there i'm, I'm working on suitability so do me a favor you have some ideas about how to do that uh give me give me your thoughts all right till uh, next time